a virtual world where almost anything can be automated with the push of a button will soon be here. The most basic but fundamental parts of our daily lives will be programmable and automated with the developing but still uncertain technology. There is a pervasive view of one thing, that SDN is one of the most disruptive technologies that we've seen to networking in decades. This is a movement that is not turning back. Once you get a taste of programming the network, you're not going back to being unable to do so. Software-defined networking will soon be a central part of the virtualized network, but it has steep challenges ahead. If you look today at the, at the core network, right, um, it's not ready for software-defined networking for the SDN technologies that we have. This is infrastructure. It's like concrete, you know, it's bedrock. And so, like, uh, upgrading is very disruptive, and we really rely on this stuff. And so we haven't seen a lot of innovation in networking traditionally. We live in historic times, driven by innovation. But is technology providing real value? And how do we translate that value into our lives, our companies, our network? How do we stay connected without draining vital resources? Are we moving towards efficiency and sustainability? Or are we weakening the network? A connected world is what we strive for. It changes the world we live in every day, every minute, and sometimes every second. It's what makes our lives better. It's the future of the network. The biggest single day sporting event of the year is the Super Bowl. Over 80,000 people pack themselves into one stadium and hundreds of millions more text, email, and post video online in a span of three action-packed hours. A large-scale and robust communications network must be able to absorb this spike in network traffic, but just as quickly be able to pull the network back to normal capacity. Today, this takes weeks to prepare and implement. Very soon, it will take a few taps of a button. Super Bowl is predictable. You know when it's going to happen. You can get resources in place. You can do manual configuration like we've been doing for 20 years. Um, a better example would be, say, a natural disaster when no one has any idea that it's going to happen. Suddenly you need resources, uh, you know, computing communication resources. You have to uh, apply policy to them. You know, who gets to use them? What's the most important application? That's where it can be enormously useful. So the current state is that for every network service they want to launch, voice, video, what have you, they need to actually guess how many users they'll have at peak, say Mother's Day or New Year's Eve, and then build for that peak capacity uh, and build it with dedicated equipment per service, dedicated boxes piled high. right? And then all year round, they actually work in under capacity. So there's built-in uh, underutilization in the model. And because it's so complex and it's dedicated, it means it takes them about two years to roll out such a service. And if they need more capacity, what we call in the cloud business elasticity, it actually takes them months, even a year, to add more capacity because it means buying a box, delivering it to the, um, to the edge of the network, installing it, configuring it, et cetera, et cetera. The virtualization of storage and computing resources is well underway. But why is a virtualized network so far behind? So networking actually hasn't changed much in about 30 years. And, you know, we've got, <laughs> we've got a whole discipline of networking, which I've been in for a long time, and we always come up with new protocols and new security paradigms, and it's been very difficult for it to be adopted. And the reason is, is because, you know, this is infrastructure. It's like concrete, you know, it's bedrock. And so, like, uh, upgrading is very disruptive, and we really rely on this stuff. And so we haven't seen a lot of innovation in networking traditionally. Traditionally, networking would couple the control plane, which is the brain, with the data plane, which is the hardware forwarding path. And the, 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 the core architecture of the internet said that there had to be effectively a brain for each switch. That means that I, as a programmer, would have to program each one of these little brains, which means I have to write a purely distributed program, which is hard. So now that we know what the problem is, a network that is too complex, closed, and proprietary, what is the solution? Not long ago, a new technology proposed how to build a more flexible network. It became known as Software Defined Networking, or SDN. SDN is based on the idea of separating the information traveling across the network, or data plane, from
from the system directing that information through the network or control plane. By separating these two planes, networks will presumably be far more flexible, scalable, and programmable. So if we look at what SDN does, it allows you to have this extended control plane across an entire network. Today, every network device that people are deploying, whether it's from HP or somebody else, typically has a separation of control and data plane, but it's inside one device. If you look at their data center, they may have 148 port switches. If you can take that notion of separating control and data plane and get it across the whole network, it takes that 148 port switch network and turns it into a single 4800 port switch network. And now it becomes much simpler and you only have to touch one thing to now automate processes. The older world of having to program, commission, install, and configure network equipment at the equipment itself through the user interface that was prescribed, the need to have technicians who are skilled, certified to do that kind of work, um, that changes dramatically when you have a, the ability to look at all of the resources in the network in a centralized way and use a single centralized control and provisioning and orchestration uh, capability so that you can move resources around and configure your network from a single location. That's truly transformational for, for infrastructure. It's simply about designing at a very high level, using very high level constructs. So a typical web tier application has the web tier, the front end web tier, and then there's a business logic tier and the back end database tier. It sounds really simple, but the instantiation is quite complex. But as the user, as someone who wants to design the web tier application, all I need to do is go to the portal and specify that I want three tiers. In the web tier, I want, let's say, 50 machines. In the um, business logic tier, I want 50 machines. In the database tier, I want 50 machines. And I want only HTTP traffic between these tiers. And I want a load balancer in front. And I want firewall to protect my database tier. That's all I say, and I push a button, and instantly, all that is delivered. One of the use cases that we find an awful lot of early interest in on, on the SDN side is network monitoring, um, which is facilitated by um, tapping into the network. Um, and so today, what enterprises do is that they will tap into um, their network to monitor that traffic for their most important connections and most important points because it's very expensive to do today. One of, the, one of the expected benefits of SDN is that you could change and make any Ethernet port into a port that could, that could then monitor or mirror the traffic into a monitoring solution. And so one of the expectations is that you could use SDN to be able to drive this network uh, monitoring across the entire network so that you can actually start to, start to uh, pinpoint into areas where you have trouble, not just on your most important links. Virtualizing network infrastructure is on the minds of CTOs across the world. But network virtualization presents new challenges for legacy equipment that some say are not ready for SDN technologies. I think if you look at some of the bottlenecks that exist within enterprise IT and cloud today, those networking assets and the flexibility in those networks are, are a bottleneck in, in existing technologies. And I'm speaking specifically of SDN. If you look today at the, at the core network, right, um, it's not ready for software-defined networking for the SDN technologies that we have there um, because it's, you know, a lot of it is still on proprietary hardware and it's not uh, that easy to uh, separate or impossible right, and to separate the control and the data plane there. So you have to have the technology first that actually allows you to use SDN in the network. The challenges that come in is, in terms of you have probably existing infrastructure that's lying in the network uh, that's already rolled out, and that infrastructure is not SDN capable. So when you overlay, you're, you're putting another layer of infrastructure on top of it, which will be SDN enabled, but there will be certain features or functionality that will get lost because you have a legacy infrastructure uh, underlying that will not be able to support some of those features or functions there's still significant amount of investment to, to occur both in research and in the deployment of the infrastructure and in the proofing and testing of the different capabilities to mature the technologies. Um, in the infrastructure side, in the networking side, that's clearly the case. We're seeing that with the initial proof of concept work, which will then move to you know, limited trials of services and ultimately into mass deployment. And that takes time. 
So there's a time impediment to adoption simply in needing to, to, to maintain and stay the course to, to realize actual benefits. There are very limited sort of full-scale large production deployments of SDN. That's a reality. And part of the reason is because you know, the hardware wasn't quite ready, the software wasn't quite ready, the APIs weren't quite ready. I think you know, over the next 12 to 18 months, I think we'll see significant improvements around each of those arenas and a lot more understanding about what problems SDN can solve and what problems SDN can't solve. Virtualization is a common word to describe technologies in the cloud, like virtual computing resources or storage. So how does the network move from hardware to software? Network virtualization helps us to pool essentially the network elements and the components as uh, one entity so that, for instance, in a cloud networking environment, we can apply policies and automation and have the applications essentially uh, apply those without any human intervention. Virtualization is the first step of that because it allows us to pool network resources and expose that as essentially a service into a broader application or cloud orchestration platform. Virtualization and compute has changed the concept of a server from a piece of hardware to a piece of software. Networks have never had that, so you've never been able to like programmatically manage um, a network, and instead it requires human beings to do it, which you know, are slow and are error prone. A network can be very complex. As communications technologies move into the virtual world, they converge and become hard to define. The nascent time of software-defined networking in the market adds to that complexity. When the term was originally coined, it meant something very specific, um, namely two things. One, that networking hardware should be generalized so that um, you can apply you know, a software programming model to get more functionality instead of actually putting the features in hardware, which would require a very slow innovation cycle. And the second one was decoupling the control plane from the data plane, which allows us to, instead of writing fully distributed programs, we can write more distributed systems. And so we have more flexibility from a software standpoint. I think it was quickly adopted from there into the data center world. And the data center has been going through a massive transformation in terms of the evolution from VLANs, in order to virtualize uh, the network inside uh, a data center towards putting in hypervisors to create hosts for applications. And then it's really gotten very complex. So in this pursuit of making things really simple, we've just added all this new complexity. It's good to start with uh, knowing what SDN is, because there's a lot of hype and a lot of misunderstanding about what software-defined networking really means. Um, software-defined networking is really simply the separation of the control plane in the network from the forwarding plane. And to me, if, if a network has that separation, it's an SDN, and if it doesn't, it isn't. SDN technologies present opportunities for carriers that did not exist even a year ago. While the benefits are clear, the adoption rate is still marginal. So what's the holdup? We have a lot of, uh, you know, equipment in the telco networks today that are just not, you, you cannot just work with an SDN technology approach in that environment until you're actually ready to have a standard architecture that runs across that where SDN really then comes to full bear. Now the networks are already to a large extent built and so you don't see a lot of greenfield. We, we will start to see some greenfield deployments but largely there is a tremendous amount of investment that has gone on into deploying networks and so the approach we are taking which is very unique is to allow for virtualization and uh, automation of any existing data center network. The service providers have said, I've got the network and there's value in just having network connectivity, but there's even more value and more revenue to be had by providing some services themselves. And so SDN, to the extent that it can virtualize the services and allow them to be deployed more quickly, can give the service providers uh, you know, leg up on um, you know, rapid service deployment and rapid monetization of those services. For many service providers, SDN is still in the early stage of adoption as the real-world benefits are still not well-defined. What you really need to think through as a service provider is, A, which choices do I make? But B, how do I get the operational model done right? There's one great example that a service provider shared with me. Um, they took one service, um, DNS, and automated it, which means also automating the application lifecycle through the cloud, um, meaning one click to deploy. That same customer 
deploys the same application in the physical world, it takes them 35 people over 16 months to deploy. So in the case of SDN, you can not only gain information from the network like you could do traditionally, but you can actually get that information in a logically centralized manner and then do analysis over it. So for example, if you wanted to optimize for power by turning off links, you could get a global view and you could start turning off links in a way that doesn't affect the traffic, for example. So, so it doesn't give you more information, but allows you to do more with the information once you do get it. What we learned in the data center was that a lot of the serving capacity and compute capacity was about 10% utilized most of the time. In a virtualized world, they can push that towards 70 and 80% and maybe even beyond that. That's pretty much unheard of in a, in a networking environment. SDN cannot make the network more efficient alone. It is implemented with other technologies, perhaps the most important of which is Network Function Virtualization, or NFV. NFV takes what is traditionally a single hardware appliance, be it caching, firewall, or load balancing, and turns it into a pool of machines that are performing the same function virtually. If we start with NFV and we assume it's the separation of the hardware from the software, you will have basically containers of where you can deploy a virtual machine and an application within that virtual machine. So that's where you see the separation from the software from the hardware. It's not shipped as an integrated system. It's shipped as a common platform that you will then deploy the software on top of. Now the question is now, you have all these things running, but how do you get the network traffic over to them in an efficient manner? And that's where SDN comes in. SDN allows you to rearrange the plumbing in a very efficient manner to get to these virtualized appliances so you can run the traffic through your virtual appliances in different chains and optimize them and get the effect that you really wanted. There are a lot of service layer things that sit above the packet forwarding layer of a network that today we're deploying a lot of hardware for. And sometimes that hardware is not fully utilized. Um, but if we can start to take some of the learnings from server virtualization and cloud orchestration and apply those to some of those uh, you know, data processing problems, um, that's what NFE wants to be able to take advantage of. And, and then, uh, you know, the benefits of that are going to be around CapEx spend, um, operational simplicity, uh, better utilization of, of the power and the resources that are supporting those workloads. So to make NFV a reality, it's not just about virtualizing the network, but about truly automating everything. It's automating the application lifecycle. How do I have one click to deploy a complicated network service? It's automating its lifecycle, um, in fact, of um, how, do I, well, how do I deal with failures? How do I scale up a service? Um, you need to automate how you manage many distributed clouds. And you also need to automate the specific cloud elements or specific cloud nodes that live in the distributed network, whether it's their uptime to get them up and running in two hours or less, or their life cycle so that when servers die, when hard drives die, when you add more capacity, everything is fully automated and doesn't need human intervention. So you see customers now that have been buying hardware and, and putting this in the central office, they're now building data centers and they're basically running the software that, that you know, was running on that hardware previously in a virtualized fashion, in a scale-out fashion. Um, and obviously that requires SDN to be able to, to connect that between each other and to the rest of the network. SDN allows you to change your business case and software technologies without reinventing the wheel. If you look at traffic growth on the network, it's 30, 40, 50% a year. Their revenue's not growing at that clip. So they've got to keep up with network demand, put more network infrastructure, put more um, scalable network infrastructure in, but all the while figure out how they can monetize that network more rapidly. Because if they you know, just try to manage the cost side of the equation, that's eventually going to break um, with, with the pace of traffic growth. Previously, an operator, to put a new service out over its network, would have to go through literally months, if not years, of validating that service and all the equipment, and then deploying that equipment across its network to make that service possible for its customer base. Now with SDN, you can actually validate and test it in a virtual environment and push that out across the network literally in minutes. The types of use cases our customers are trying to uh, deploy in the enterprise are things like IT as a service, where they want an elastic architecture for their infrastructure. They want their IT organizations to be able to enable the IT resources in a much more flexible way, where customers, their internal customers in this case, can self-serve 
physical servers or uh, compute infrastructure, storage, or network resources without filing trouble tickets and waiting six weeks. The idea of network virtualization and a lot of the SDN concepts is I rack and stack once and I have a set of shared resources that I can reuse. And so then telcos are able to more quickly deploy new services because a lot of the underlying physical infrastructure is already there. Network operators are always challenged to compete in a burgeoning ecosystem of over-the-top service providers. Monetizing services, increasing efficiency, and lowering costs become imperative. But SDN may not be the silver bullet solution. The early promise of SDN was that it was going to dramatically reduce costs, whether it's CapEx or OpEx. We haven't seen that that's going to necessarily be the case in terms of radi radical reduction. What we do see is that it will shift how, how expenses are going to happen, and we see that it's going to shift how um, services can be much more flexible. And whether that becomes a, a silver bullet or not remains to be seen. I think the promise and where we want to focus is it makes you money. It makes you money by taking a lot of the barriers of networking out of the way to service deployment. Some of the big opportunities for service are uh, either things that uh, the users can derive value from as it relates to their network experience. So maybe it's a secure connection, or maybe it's a, um, a high quality of service. If I'm a gamer, or if I'm you know watching a video on my mobile device, if I could you know pay a little bit more to ensure you know high quality of service. So those are the services that service providers have seen some success in monetizing. And what SDN can do is it can give them a staging ground to deploy those services, so that they don't have to deploy all new network infrastructure to run those services. They can deploy them in a virtualized environment, which means they can deploy them more quickly, which means they can scale them up more easily. You know, it's the same promise that we have with the cloud. For example, today they use hardware that's in the network for 10 years or more, taking a big footprint, a lot of energy, and of course with Moore's Law, with processors being two times more efficient every two years, um, they really, really don't benefit from that. So from the pure infrastructure level, you should expect to see service providers being able to uh, keep in line with the IT industry and leverage Moore's Law, meaning get twice as much compute on the same footprint or shrink their footprint in half to get the same compute every year. So that's one key, key benefit. So one of our enterprise customers is a large uh, financial services institution. And because they're regulated, they have to basically take every aspect of their network and put a firewall behind it. So meaning, let's say if it's geography based, so every state and then every division, say, you know, investment banking versus commercial banking versus loans. So when you start to do that, you start multiplying um, the number of firewalls that they need to have to secure each of these resources to meet the regulations. Well, the result of that is that they now have servers and storage and, and even network devices behind each of those firewalls. And so that's expensive to them. So what they start to look at SDN for is if they can securely virtualize their network um, and eliminate the need of all of these physical firewalls, they believe that they can drive efficiency, but it's not through um, cheaper networking equipment or, um, or buying less networking gear. It's because they see that they could save between 3 to 5x the amount that they spend on compute and storage um, today, which that is a, a much larger massive number than, than the raw networking numbers. At the same time that cloud systems were proving to be wildly successful with virtualized compute and storage, networks had gone decades with relatively limited innovation, putting its inflexibility in stark contrast. As networking fell further behind data center innovations, something had to give. We started to see movement maybe, I don't know, five, six years ago where um, companies started developing networking fabrics for data center and things like that. And I think that was actually um, a, a beginning to how SDN came to be. When you think about SDN, you could really think about it really starting in the campus. Uh, it's really something that came out of academia that took hold then in the startup community, primarily to open up and be able to expand what could be done with a networking box. So today, a traditional router switch uh, you know, has historically been difficult to go and try to innovate on top of because it's a closed environment. Just as what happened with the mainframe industry that developed to the PC, at the same time, merchant switching silicon has come along to make it easier for someone to build a very simple switch, to build a simple forwarding plane, that can then be controlled from the outside from software developed by a third party. So we get this sort of delamination of networking just as happened in the PC industry back in the 1980s. And so SDN, although the ideas have been around for a while, it's just sort of, it's time is now. 
To access the forwarding plane of the network, a communication protocol named OpenFlow was created. While other protocols exist, OpenFlow is currently the most recognized standard. OpenFlow actually came out of a, a PhD project of Martin Casado when he was a PhD student here. And uh, there was a, a project that we had called Ethane. And uh, that was really the first one that we had worked on that had this separation of the control plane from the forwarding plane. I actually used to work with the intelligence community. And um, at the time, you know, I worked in these very secure networks. And it was, it was really clear that, that you know, n networking technology hasn't evolved assuming that um, you're protecting against, for example, um, a nation state. And so in the intelligence community, we could program the computers to have the kind of defensive posture that we needed to. But for the network, there's kind of, there's no knob, there's no programming model. So we couldn't actually augment them in a way that we needed to. And so it was, it was the long pole in the tent. It required the most care and feeding. It required the most time. And so that kind of started this path, this kind of journey down, how do you make networks more programmable, which led to OpenFlow, which then broadly led to this movement we call SDN. OpenFlow enables some applications, but then there, there's also a whole range of orchestration and management uh, infrastructure that has to fit around that to enable the full SDN vision. So, um, so we see OpenFlow as something that's really driven SDN over the recent years. It's something that will continue to be important, but it's by no means not you know, the, the magic bullet that um, solves all carriers' problems. So I think what we're going to find is that we're going to see a smattering and a, and a fair number of protocols that are going to be out there, of which OpenFlow is just going to be one, and it's going to be um, for particular users, whether you're telco or enterprise, you need to pick the best protocol that fits within your organization that meets the business problem that you're trying to solve. With the advent of new technologies, industry commonly reaches a tipping point when it realizes the need to migrate to the latest innovation. We see the tipping point, if you will, um, already you know, starting next year, where you will start to see SDN being deployed in private data centers, in pure play cloud service providers, in um, you know, data centers that are requiring the automation and the programmability for delivering these cloud services. Today where we're at is we're just in the very early adoption by, um, by very early customers for software-defined networking. Um, and that's a natural evolution and progression, which is we're just entering the phase where there are products that are getting out that can help solve real business problems. And so the early adopters are still cutting their, their teeth on those, on those early solutions. And I expect that what we'll find is that over the course of the next 18 to 24 months, that we'll start to get to that tipping point, but we're definitely not there today. As an academic, I think we passed the tipping point. Lots of academics are interested, researchers are interested, there's lots of new ideas. From, an, from the point of view of industry, clearly it takes a lot more um, uh, investment, a lot more time, uh, a lot more emotional attachment to the idea, I think, before it really uh, passes that tipping point. We've seen some really interesting RFIs coming from telcos lately that um, are really starting to solidify the use cases for SDN and NFV um, and, and really start to have, starting to drive the entire industry on some specific deployment models. And, and so, yeah, it really feels like that tipping point is really close, if not here already. With the explosion of cloud services, networking hardware is being designed to make it easier for software overlays to deploy and interoperate. Some industry suppliers say this will put communications hardware equipment in jeopardy of being commoditized. Others disagree. Many people fear that, oh, isn't this commoditization? Isn't this a destruction of the way that the business works? If you'd like to think of it that way, yes, it is. But it's a natural order of things to go to a cleaner architectural abstraction that is both cheaper from a capex point of view and cheaper from an operational point of view for the network operators. This has to be good for society overall. At the hardware level, you'll have commodity hardware. We see off-the-shelf merchant silicon becoming more and more capable. Uh, you know, in the kind of time frame you're talking about, another one to two years, um, that starts to become a, a real alternative to some of the uh, big iron switches that we've seen today. But that doesn't mean the incumbent vendors are going away, because if you look at the the um, trajectory of some of the real high-end switches and routers, then you know, they're going to be around to stay and we're going to see you know, very high throughput out of those platforms as well, but working within much more of an open ecosystem. Certainly, I think in specialized hardware for networking, specialized firewalls, specialized load balancers, I think the reality is that very specialized hardware can always give you better price performance than a generic piece of equipment, a general CPU, like an Intel or an ARM or whatever it is. 
Um, having said that, the amount of investment in general purpose CPUs and just the effect of Moore's law dictates that you know, over time they will always catch up. Now you can decide to invest in proprietary hardware and just get an edge, but at some point, except for very niche applications, the return on investment is not going to be great anymore. And at that point, I think then the commodity will be good enough. I think that's what it comes down to. There are hurdles in the way of SDN adoption, and the biggest one may be security. While one theory holds that opening a traditionally closed device to additional communication is a serious threat to the network, another theory claims that a distributed networking environment can help create a more secure network. Either way, changes will likely lead to new ideas around security. One of the challenges we see in talking to some enterprise customers is the requirement for PCI compliance in their um, hosted applications. And there's a well understand method of placing a firewall between a network and an external place that um, is required for that PCI compliance. And as we virtualize things and move away from the model of sticking a box in front of that packet flow, it's very difficult to demonstrate that PCI compliance. And, and, and so we need to start thinking about new models on how, on what's acceptable and, and how network separation and policy enforcement is done and where it's placed in the network. If you're now moving a bunch of virtualized workloads uh, onto a server and you're managing it with a controller, uh, you now have a number of touch points that didn't exist before. So especially if you have a centralized controller, what happens if that controller gets compromised? Uh, at the node level, when you think about the actual server running those virtual workloads, uh, there's a number of, of uh, technologies we're currently delivering as an example of where we're trying to say, how do I make sure that that particular box isn't tampered with? The industry also needs to realize that some of the benefits of SDN are around automation and orchestration. And what that can actually create is a more secure environment because I have a very consistent method to deploy my security policy. So instead of touching 50 firewalls to enforce a service, I can touch one control plane that could then instantiate that security policy in a distributed manner. But I know it's consistent because it's automated and, and programmed underneath instead of relying on potential human error as I go and touch those 50 things. How will software defined networking and network function virtualization impact our industries and our network? Will SDN technologies change the face of our ecosystem, our companies, and our way of doing business? SDN is changing a lot of things for people. It's not just technology change, but it's process change, it's, it's people change. And uh, it, it's, I mean, we're moving people's cheese and they have to adopt to that. So it's not going to be something that gets adopted overnight. It's going to, we're going to see that similar 10-year adoption curve for SDN that we did for voice over IP. My belief is that somewhere around the 2014-2015 time frame is when we will cross a tipping point and have networks be SDN. Um, I think the reality though is that we'll look back five, ten years down the road and look back at this point and say, you know, what was SDN? SDN was just the next generation networking. We wouldn't talk about SDN at that point, we just talk about networking. On the road to virtual compute and storage, we've embarked on the final piece of the puzzle, a virtualized communications network. Say five to 10 years, I think we'll stop thinking about infrastructure. It'll be like a utility, it'll be like water. If I'm driving home and I'm an engineer and I have an idea and I want to create a new game, by the time I get home I can spin up some compute, I can implement it, and I won't even think about what's running it. And I think that's what we should all do. We should just stop focusing on the infrastructures that becomes easier to automate and we should start focusing on the innovation. So for the long term, we won't even talk about SDN. It's like we don't talk about electricity anymore. It's just taken for granted and we will take this for granted over time as well. Stay tuned for episode four of the Future of the Network documentary series titled The Cloud, Building in Midair, coming to TIA2013.org on October 1st.